Okay, let's go ahead and get started with today's event. My name is Brittany Saunier. I'm the Executive Director of the Partnership for Food Safety Education. And we are so pleased to have you join us today for Clean Hands, Healthy Home, a webinar in preparation for Global Hand Washing Day on October 15th. It was really important to us to um, get you today's programming so you have a little bit of time to plan your outreach to your community. Uh, for October 15th. So let's get started. We can go to the next slide, please. Next slide. There we go. <laughs> Might be a delay on my end. Um, Again, my name is Brittany Sonia. I'm the executive director. Um, we also have Katie Weston, um, our community engagement manager. She will be moderating today's event with our amazing speakers who we have here on our lineup. So for today, we'll do, uh, we'll start off with some housekeeping. We'll uh, hear from Meredith Carruthers at, from the USDA. We'll hear from Dr. Vincent Hill from CDC, and then from Mindy Costello from NSF International. And then Katie will wrap us up with some new graphics and tools that you can use on hand washing. Next slide, please. All right, so there might be a delay on my end. I apologize <laughs> for um, your uh, purposes today, feel free to use the chat box to let us know where you're coming in from, uh, where are you zooming in. Also to send a question, you can use the Q&A feature and we will be monitoring that to do a Q&A toward the end. Uh, after the webinar, there will be a brief survey and we hope that you plan to take it. Um, it's really important to our efforts to ensure that we're providing you with quality programming. Uh, it's pretty quick, so uh, we'd love to get your feedback. Next slide. And the star of today is CEUs. We know many of you are very interested in our uh, the continuing education units, and we applaud you for continuing your education. Uh, there will be um, the certificates in the chat box for you to access, a follow-up email tomorrow with links as well. And by October 8th, you should be able to go to our free resources tab and recorded webinars to access the files. Um, we do wanna make an important note that those seeking the NCHEC units will receive more information directly in a follow-up email. Next slide. And I'm seeing in the chat box, so many people from all across the nation, which is incredible, um, which is who the partnership supports. So for those of you who are not familiar with us, um, the Partnership for Food Safety Education is a public health nonprofit. Our mission is to reduce foodborne illness through effective food safety education programs. And that includes hand hygiene messaging as well. We do a lot of this work to reach communities by leveraging your networks, health and food safety educators. Uh, we serve about 13,000 of them across the na nation in a variety of sectors, um, cooperative extension, uh, food banks, um, goodness, K through 12 um, school settings, as well as local and state regulators and public health. We do this work in a cross-sector collaboration with federal agencies and uh, with those from the food industry and consumer groups. And we have about 46 partner organizations. And we do this together, uh, all in the name of advancing trusted, consistent, science-based behavioral health messaging. Next slide. And some of you may not know, or uh, this may be a, a nice reminder as to why this work is important. About one in six Americans will experience foodborne illness, also commonly called food poisoning. Uh, 128,000 are hospitalized a year from uh, foodborne illness. And unfortunately, about 3,000 die from eating contaminated food a year. So it's a very serious public health problem. And one of the key steps to prevention is hand washing, and we're excited to bring that um, information to you today. Next step. 
or next slide. And to, to bring it home as to why we do food safety education and include hand hygiene in that as an important key step, um, I want to introduce you to this amazing family of cooks. <laughs> we have Cole, Clayton, and their great grandma, Barb. And recently they did um, a recipe contest that we hosted that incorporated the Safe Recipe Style Guide, which the very first step of this style guide is to wash your hands. Um, before you begin meal preparation. And they recently participated in an event with us. And what I learned from a conversation with them in preparation for this event was hand washing was introduced to them as a key step through this activity. So this just goes to show that raising awareness is really important. And sometimes just a simple activity or communication or social media posts can really help raise awareness and influence behavior change. They now have um, shared with us that hand washing is always the first thing they do and they understand now more and more the importance of that to good health. Next slide. And I believe now Katie is going to take us away with um, kicking us off with a poll question. Yep. Thank you, Brittany. So Global Hand Washing Day is coming up next Friday, October 15th, and we want to know how you plan to promote or participate in that this year. So if you could take a minute, we'll leave that up for about a minute. If you if you have something planned and you don't see it in the options there, throw that in the chats or if you want to share more with each other about what you plan to do, you can put that in the chats too. Like if you have links to anything, um, we'd love for us all to share that together. We'll give maybe another 30 seconds to make sure everyone has a chance to respond. Okay, Michelle, would you show us the results? Okay. Oh, wow. It looks like 58% of us plan to remind family and friends to practice good hand hygiene. 38% plan on sharing graphics on social media. 25% are still deciding. So check the chats and see if anyone shared some good ideas. And 8% plan to distribute flyers at an in-person event and 1% are hosting a virtual event. Thanks for sharing everyone. It's good to see what everyone else is working on. It gives us ideas for what we can do for Global Hand Washing Day. So next up, I would like to introduce you to Meredith Carruthers. Meredith is a technical information specialist with the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, where she works in food safety education and promotes safe food, food handling and positive behavior change. She also assists the public directly by answering food safety inquiries on the USDA meat and poultry hotline. Meredith received her master's in public health from George Mason University, and she had a concentration in community health promotion. She is very passionate about sharing food safety information to keep consumers safe from foodborne illness. And today, Meredith will be sharing with us um, some new observational research on hand washing that was conducted by the USDA. Welcome, Meredith. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for having us. Um, as Katie mentioned, we are going to talk to you today about our recent observational study research. Um, first, a little bit about us at USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service, specifically the food safety education staff. We do consumer outreach and um, have those efforts geared towards educating the public on how to safely handle, prepare, and store meat, poultry, and processed egg products to help prevent foodborne illness. Those are the uh, products that FSIS inspects and regulates out in the food stream. So that's what we focus on with uh, educating consumers about, especially uh, given that a lot of those products can cause foodborne illness amongst you know, people in the home. So overall, our main food safety messages that we focus on are the four core food safety behaviors, clean, separate, cook, and chill. And we do share this information in different outreach, um, educational outreach through multiple approaches. And recently, we've been using behavioral research to assess the impact of consumer outreach efforts, uh, specifically what we do at FSIS, 
um, to see how they affect consumer food safety behaviors or just to you know, gauge what consumers are doing so that way it can help mold what we would like to do in the future moving forward. Next slide. So for this observational research, FSIS has contracted with RTI International and their subcontractor, North Carolina State University, to conduct meal preparation studies to evaluate consumer food handling behaviors in a test kitchen. This research includes observational studies, focus groups, and web surveys. The research team can, is conducting five separate iterations of the meal preparation study. Each iteration addresses a specific consumer behavior, food preparation task, and food safety communication product. The results of each iteration provide insights for us to assess the adherence to recommended food safety behaviors and the effectiveness of a related behavior change intervention. So far, the studies have looked at the adequacy of cleaning and sanitizing events, thermometer use, poultry washing, and then ultimately, as we're talking about today, hand washing attempts by consumers. From this information, we're targeting our messaging to address the proper steps of hand washing, cleaning and sanitizing, and the risks of cross-contamination, and ultimately trying to move forward with messaging that will actually be uh, well received by consumers. Next slide. So in the first year of our study, we observed kitchen behaviors of consumers preparing turkey burgers and a side salad in, a, in the test kitchen, as well as observing their thermometer use. In the second year of our study, we observed the kitchen behaviors of consumers who self-reported washing poultry while they prepared chicken thighs and a side salad and ultimately looked at cross-contamination factors as well as cleaning and sanitizing after washing poultry. And then in the third year of the study, we observed the kitchen behaviors of consumers preparing not ready to eat frozen stuffed chicken breast products as well as frozen corn products. During year three, we also conducted a nationally representative web survey with a diverse set of topics such as recall and outbreak fatigue and experiences with foodborne illness in their own home. Next slide. So ultimately the results from the observational study have been wonderful for us to receive, but they have shown a consistent pattern that consumers are not aware of basic food safety behaviors. And some of the most startling findings of our research are that, you know, hand washing is not anywhere near where we would hope it to be amongst consumers. So during all three years of the observational study so far, we have found that participants are failing to properly clean their hands up to 99% of the time before and during, excuse me, before and during meal preparation. The most common result or most common reason for unsuccessful hand washing when it was attempted was not scrubbing hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Other errors included not wetting their hands with water before applying soap and not drying their hands with a clean one use towel, which are crucial steps to hand washing. In the studies, the way that hand washing is observed and coded is by the total number of attempts per observation based on food preparation, on the food preparation skill the participants are completing in that year's study, a certain number of required hand washing attempts was predetermined. And then each hand washing event is coded as adequate or inadequate based on the criteria set by CDC, which are to wet hands with water, rub hands with soap for at least 20 seconds, rinse hands with water and dry hands using a clean one use towel. For example, participant 001T was required to wash their hands nine times during their food preparation or during their observation, but attempted to wash their hands only two times. Of these two times, neither was coded as successful because they did not scrub their hands for a total of 20 seconds. Our analysis only considered the compliance with CDC's hand washing criteria, and we did not consider risk reduction from participants following some but not all required steps of a successful hand washing event. We can go on to the next slide. We're gonna go through some of the specific results from each year. In year one, ultimately we observed participants with 2,249 cases in which a hand washing attempt was required to control pathogens. Of these, in the control group specifically, hand washing was only attempted 31% of the time required. And among the hand washing attempts attempted, only 4% of the attempts contained all steps of a correct hand washing event. 
As shown in the table on the right, the most common reason for unsuccessful hand washing was not rubbing hands with soap for at least 20 seconds, followed by not wetting their hands with water. We can go to the next slide. In year two, we observed 2,063 cases in which a hand, wa hand washing event would have been required to prevent cross-contamination during meal preparation. And of these, hand washing was attempted 25% of the time. Among hand washing events attempted, 1% of the attempts contained all steps of a correct hand washing event. The most common reason for unsuccessful hand washing in this year was, again, not using uh, soap for at least 20 seconds, followed by not wetting hands with water. And um, in this year as well, 22 attempts did not include proper drying with a one-use towel. So that's ultimately the reason why they weren't successful. But as we've been you know, learning more about hand washing, dish and hand towels and using that towel as a last step is a necessary step to help remove the last little bit of pathogens on your hand. We can go to year three. So consistent with years one and two, hand washing compliance was low again in year three. We observed 1,003 cases in which a hand washing event was required to prevent cross-contamination during meal preparation. Um, the required hand washing events this year uh, varied based on each participant's handling behaviors. And as a result, some participants had a greater number of required hand washing events than others, such as they touched the packaging of the not ready to eat chicken product more often. So this year's coding was a little bit different, but still same concept. Um, ultimately, of these 1,003 cases, hand washing was attempted only 5% of the time that it was required, and about 72% of participants attempted to wash their hands before beginning meal preparation, which is great, but among these hand washing attempts, only 5% of them contained the correct steps for hand washing and were considered successful. The most common reason, again, for unsuccessful hand washing was not rubbing hands with soap for 20 seconds. We can go to the next slide. So among the three years of data that we have so far, we can clearly see that there's still some work to be done on educating consumers about how to properly wash their hands um, and, and encouraging them to adhere to these hand washing uh, guidelines that we all you know, really preach and set forth. But you know, observations for year four of the study have been completed and we are hoping to get them out very soon um, with the data completed so far that we do have from the three years. We have utilized the information to refocus our consumer education efforts with a renowned attention to the clean food safety step and specifically hand washing. Um, we most recently have done this through the creation of hand washing educational videos, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic to help demonstrate these five steps to hand washing. And we've promoted those on our social media channels um, and with other means as well. For potential long-term changes in hand washing behavior as a result of the pandemic, we are hoping to be able to use our research the last remaining year that we're planning for our year search research for year five um, to help determine how some of these behaviors have changed as a result through the pandemic and then ultimately how that can influence our messaging in the future, as well as relying on other federal partners um, in the partnership for any data that they've collected as well. And overall, the key takeaway is that we really believe that hand washing is an area where we can make progress um, all together and that this research um, has a significant impact in, in helping guide us to get there and that we can all use this to help significantly reduce foodborne illness. And so for my last slide, I have the website up here for where our, all of our consumer research is housed. Um, you can find all of the year's full reports so far, and then my email is on the screen as well in case anybody has any questions that don't get answered in the webinar today. But thank you so much. Thank you so much, Meredith, for sharing that research with us. Like you said, it's an important reminder about how we can all work on hand washing together to maybe improve some of those um, statistics that you shared. And now I'd like to welcome Dr. Vincent Hill. Dr. Hill is an expert in environmental microbiology and issues around water sanitation and hygiene. He's chief of the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch, which oversees CDC's hand hygiene activities in community settings, cleaning, and disinfection in community settings. 
Um, waterborne disease activities, including domestic and international waterborne disease outbreak investigations and national surveillance for, and I might not say this correctly, Christosporidiosis and uh, Giardiasis. Dr. Hill received his PhD in environmental science and engineering from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Public Health and an MSc in environmental engineering from Johns Hopkins University. He's the author of more than 140 peer-reviewed journal articles, scientific reports, and patents focused on environmental microbiology and engineering. Dr. Hill, thank you so much for being with us here. Thanks, thanks, thanks very much, Katie, and you, you did great. I get tripped up on cryptosporidiasis <laughs> all the time. <clears throat> thank you. <laughs> So yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for having us uh, for having me today. Uh, hi everybody. My, so again, Vincent Hill, Chief of the Waterborne Disease Prevention Branch at CDC. And so thanks so much for having me today. Uh, I'll be presenting uh, on the work CDC has done to understand changes in hand washing related behaviors during the COVID-19 pandemic among US populations. The next. Before we discuss our work around understanding hand washing behavior during the pandemic, I wanted to briefly discuss CDC's major COVID-19 uh, prevention strategies. Next slide. Vaccination among people 12 years and older is currently the leading public health prevention strategy to end the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, anyone 12 years of age or older who is not yet vaccinated should get vaccinated as soon as possible. Uh, for those who are not fully vaccinated, CDC recommends several important prevention behaviors uh, in addition to getting vaccinated. These include wearing a mask, which covers your mouth and nose, uh, putting a distance of at least six feet between yourself and others who don't live in your household, uh, and avoiding crowds and poorly ventilated spaces. Um, and due to the circulating and highly contagious Delta variant, CDC recommends that people who are fully vaccinated should also wear masks uh, indoors in public. Next. So in, in addition, uh, there are several healthy behaviors that all people should continue to practice, including washing your hands often with soap and water or using alcohol-based hand sanitizer, sanitizer if soap and water are not available, uh, covering coughs and sneezes, cleaning frequently touched surfaces, uh, and monitoring your health daily. Uh, so, so those, those are always things that we should be doing uh, during the pandemic here. Um, and today we'll be focusing on CDC's work to understand hand washing uh, related be prevention behaviors. Next. So since the start of the pandemic, CDC has conducted a range of quantitative and qualitative studies to better understand hand washing behaviors among uh, US adults to inform hand washing promotion strategies. Next. During the COVID-19 response, many questions emerged related to community hand hygiene behaviors, including who is or is not washing their hands? When are people washing their hands? What do people know or think about hand washing? How are people engaging in hand washing? And what influences people's decisions to wash their hands? Next. To help us understand how common hand washing behavior was among US adults, we analyzed data from a nationally representative survey of over 6,000 US adults conducted in March and April of 2020. Participants were asked the question, what, if any precautions, are you taking to prevent coronavirus? Uh, washing hands with soap and water was one of the responses they could choose. Overall, we found that 93% of US adults reported washing their hands with soap and water frequently to prevent coronavirus. Next. When this data was stratified by sex, we found that women more often reported frequent hand washing than men. This difference, is, uh, this difference was statistically significant, but rates for both women and men were high. Next. And when hand washing was examined by age category, we found that respondents in older age categories more often reported frequent hand washing than respondents in younger age categories. Additionally, respondents 60 years of age or older reported more frequent hand washing than all younger age categories. And these differences were statistically significant. Next slide. And finally, when we stratified by race or ethnicity, we didn't see any significant differences in the prevalence of frequent hand washing between groups. Next. 
We built upon this hand-washing behavior work um, in a second project where we analyzed survey data from 5,000 adults collected in June 2020. In this survey, we asked about the frequency of hand-washing after touching a high-touch surface in public. We found that 78.5% of survey respondents uh, frequently wash their hands after touching high-touch surfaces in public. Next. We also looked at factors associated with frequent hand washing after touching high touch surfaces. Similar to the first su survey I described, we found that having a female gender or an older age uh, were associated with more frequent hand washing. But differing from the first survey, we found that Asian non-Hispanic participants were more likely to self-report frequent hand washing compared to white non-Hispanic participants. Finally, knowing someone who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, and having a higher level of concern about risk for SARS-CoV-2, these were both associated with more frequent hand washing. Next. We also wanted to better understand changes in hand washing behavior during the COVID-19 pandemic compared to before the pandemic. We compared nationally representative survey data collected in October 2019 to data collected in June of 2020. In both surveys, the same question was asked. In which of these situations or settings are you most likely to remember to wash your hands? The six key times listed here uh, were provided and respondents could choose as many options as they desired. Next. Overall, we found that respondents in both 2019 and 2020 frequently reported washing hands before, prepare, before, before preparing food at home, as well as after using the bathroom at home and in public. However, respondents less commonly reported remembering to wash their hands before eating at home, before eating at a restaurant, and after sneezing, coughing, or blowing their nose. Next. To determine if there were significant differences between 2019 and 2020, we compared the percentages of respondents who reported remembering to wash hands in 2020 to the percentages in 2019 for each of the key times controlling for several demographic and socioeconomic factors. Compared to 2019, respondents in 2020 were 1.7 times more likely to remember to wash their hands before eating at home, two times more likely to remember to wash hands before eating in a restaurant, 1.4 times more likely to remember to wash hands after using the bathroom at home, and 2.3 times more likely to remember to wash hands after experiencing respiratory symptoms. Next. Overall, we found that the largest increases in percentage of respondents remembering to wash their hands occurred before eating at home, before eating in a restaurant, and after experiencing respiratory symptoms. However, despite these improvements, less than 75% of respondents reported remembering to wash their hands in these situations, that is, before eating at home, before eating in a restaurant, and after experiencing respiratory symptoms. Also, across both time points and many uh, different situations, men, younger adults and white adults were less likely to remember to wash their hands. So public health outreach efforts should consider messages that resonate with these groups. Next. Now that we had a good sense of who was or was not washing their hands, we wanted to understand what psychosocial factors were influencing hand washing behaviors. To do this, we asked a series of questions informed by the capability, motivation, opportunity, and behavior model in a nationally representative survey of over 3,000 adults, US, US adults. Respondents were asked the question, what, if any, precautions are you taking to prevent coronavirus? Uh, with uh, washing hands in, with soap and water as, one, as a response option. Respondents were also asked additional questions to assess capability, opportunity, and motivation to wash hands and perceive severity and susceptibility of COVID-19. Next. Overall, 88.6% of respondents reported washing hands with soap and water to prevent COVID-19. Preliminary analyses of these data have indicated that factors associated with higher odds of self-reported hand washing to prevent COVID-19 include reporting that hand washing is a habit in daily life, having high levels of motivation to wash hands to prevent COVID-19, having concern about one's own risk for infection with COVID-19, a perceived severity of COVID-19 as an illness, and perceived behavioral control to prevent COVID-19, which is, which is a way of saying how much control an individual feels they have 
over their ability to prevent becoming sick with COVID-19. Next. The final survey I'd like to discuss focus on understanding the US public's knowledge, attitudes, and practices around hand drying during the pandemic. Because germs spread more easily when hands are wet, proper hand washing includes that critical fifth step, which is to dry hands using a clean towel or by air drying them. In October, 2020, an 18-question survey was administered to over 500 adults. Survey questions focused on factors influencing choice of hand drying method, beliefs about risk of SARS-CoV-2 exposure and transmission using different hand drying methods, changes in preferred hand drying method before versus during the pandemic, and knowledge gaps in hand drying methods. Next. When asked what influences their choice of hand drying method at a public bathroom, 47% of respondents selected which drying methods are available, 43% of respondents selected not having to touch surfaces, and 42% of respondents selected cleanliness of the bathroom. Respondents also frequently selected that the cleanliness of the drying method and the speed at which the drying methods dried their hands also influenced their choice of method. Next. We asked a set of questions around respondents' beliefs related to the likelihood of exposure or transmission of COVID-19 from using different hand drying methods. Next. When asked how much they agreed or disagreed with the statement that they are less likely to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2 by using electric hand dryers instead of paper towels, 71% of respondents were neutral or somewhat agreed or strongly agreed. Next. 62% of respondents were neutral or somewhat disagreed or strongly agreed, I'm sorry, or strongly disagreed that using paper towels instead of electric hand dryers reduced their likelihood of being exposed to SARS-CoV-2. So together, these data suggest that there may be confusion or a lack of information around whether certain hand drying methods may increase the likelihood of exposure or transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Next. Despite CDC messaging that the final step of hand washing should be to dry your hands using a clean towel or air dry them, when asked whether or not fully drying hands could spread SARS-CoV-2, 38% of respondents were neutral. As I mentioned, right, ger germs can be transferred more easily when hands are wet. And so while we do not know if this is the case with SARS-CoV-2, the proportion of respondents who are neutral in answering this question may suggest that the importance of fully drying hands after hand washing may not be reaching people uh, uh, in the United States. Next. Um, in addition, so respondents were concerned about the risk of SARS-CoV-2 transmission from touching surfaces and bathrooms. In, in public bathrooms, with 51% of respondents saying they strongly agree that touching surfaces can spread SARS-CoV-2. Next, 60% of respondents said they somewhat or strongly agreed that they prefer to use paper towels in bathrooms, in public bathrooms, so that they can use them to minimize touching surfaces. Next, and 66% of respondents said they somewhat or strongly agreed that they would be more likely to use electric hand dryers if they had a touchless feature. Next slide. Um, sorry. Uh, we also looked at respondents' preferred hand drying method after washing their hands in public bathrooms prior to and during the COVID-19 pandemic. During the COVID-19 pandemic, respondents showed an increased preference for using electric hand dryers, wiping their hands on their own clothes, and shaking uh, their hands in the air compared to their preferred method before the pandemic. Fewer respondents reported using paper towels as their preferred method during the COVID-19 pandemic compared to before the start of the pandemic. So while fewer than 10% of respondents overall reported wiping hands on their own clothes after washing them in a public bathroom, an increase in using this hand drying method since the beginning of the pandemic was observed in, across nearly all demographic categories. Taken together, these data um, the, seem to indicate that many respondents believe that they can be exposed to SARS-CoV-2 by touching surfaces in public bathrooms and maybe changing their preferred hand drying method accordingly since the beginning of the pandemic. These data com combined with the large proportion of respondents reported not knowing that hand drying is an important step during 
hand hygiene to limit SARS-CoV-2 transmission, this suggests that more and clearer messaging is required to emphasize the importance of, hand, of drying hands after washing them by using a clean towel or by using an air dryer. Having touchless electric hand dryers and paper towel dispensers may help in increasing the likelihood that bathroom users properly dry their hands after washing them. Next slide. Given the large proportion of respondents being unsure of the importance of hand drying, these data suggest that more and clearer messages are required to emphasize the importance of drying hands after washing them by using a clean towel or by air drying them. The survey found that 44% of respondents wanted more information on which hand drying method is more hygienic, and 30% wanted more information on germs on wet hands, um, supporting the need for more messaging. Next. So in summary, and next slide, the work we have done uh, during the pandemic has highlighted that there is room for improvement in hand washing related behaviors, especially among young adults and men. Health communication and education efforts may need to focus on certain populations to address practice gaps. Uh, although many of these behaviors are not new, uh, gaps between knowledge and practices suggest that messages should address this mismatch. Uh, messages can be crafted to leverage the psychosocial predictors of hand washing related behavior, such as perceived severity, susceptibility, behavioral control, capability, motivation, and opportunity. And finally, to promote hand washing related behaviors, we need to go beyond health communication to address structural barriers to hand washing, because access to hand washing supplies and facilities plays a big part in people's ability to wash their hands. Next slide. Next steps for our team include continuing to monitor who is engaging in hand washing related behaviors and identify changes over time. Um, and we also would like to examine the impact of uh, emerging variants and vaccines on hygiene related behaviors. Um, based on our findings, we would like to craft and disseminate new messages and materials to groups with lower levels of behavioral engagement. Finally, it will be important to identify strategies to increase access to hand washing supplies and infrastructure. Next. And, and so just before I end, I wanted to mention some CDC hand washing resources in the next slide. CDC has a number of resources available on our hand washing site, including content on hand washing in the kitchen and resources from our Life is Better with Clean Hands campaign. You can also visit CDC info on demand to order free printed materials. Uh, and many of the resources on our website are also available in other languages. And uh, finally, next slide. Just wanna say um, many thanks to all the people who are involved in these projects and to thank you all for your time today. Much appreciated, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill, for sharing all that information with us. That definitely gives us some um, key areas to focus on for hand washing as we lead into Global Hand Washing Day and really throughout the year, so thank you. Um, I do wanna note I've seen a few people ask, the slides will be available in your follow-up email, so you don't have to take notes, you'll get all of this information. Now I'd like to turn it over to Mindy Costello. Mindy is a public health professional and registered sanitarian with 25 years of industry and regulatory experience. As NSF's consumer guru, she fields inquiries from regulators, manufacturers, consultants, and the public on food safety certification, water filters, water quality, wastewater, supplements, vitamins, organic food, organic personal care products, and sustainability. She's covering a lot of topics from around the world. Mindy also serves as the program manager for NSF Scrub Club, a fun, interactive, and educational website that teaches children the proper way to wash their hands. And as a parent, Scrub Club is a personal favorite of mine. So I will turn it over to Mindy to talk to you about that. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. My, uh, my favorite thing of the, the job I do at NSF International is definitely the Scrub Club. So let's go to the next slide. And um, if you haven't been to the website, it's scrubclub.org. Uh, scrub and um, these are our heroes. We have Carrie, Slick, Patience, Buff, and our newest addition uh, at the beginning of COVID, Maxwell. These characters are considered our heroes of hand washing and protecting us from germs. 
let's take a look at the next slide. We've got our Jeremy villains, which I have to say are a fan favorite of the kids. Uh, the Scrub Club is geared for kids three to eight years old. And as we all would assume, everybody loves the villains. Um, so it's really fun. We did develop a coughing Cora COVID character so that we could talk more about, you know, the current situation and, you know, mask wearing and things like that. Uh, my personal favorite is Wheezy Spew. Um, she is an exercise fiend that never runs. The only thing that's running is her nose. Um, the other one that's my, uh, you know, another favorite is Sticky Nora. Um, she's like your favorite aunt that wants to hug and kiss you and uh, representing the norovirus. So we'll go on to the next slide. We've got these great free resources on the website and I'm just gonna highlight a few so that you can get a taste for what we have available. These are all printable and uh, available for you anytime you're going into a home or you're doing a demonstration to share with your families. Uh, right now they're in English and we'll talk more about what's to come in just a second. Next slide. All right, let's take a look. So in the top corner, we've got find the germs. We just scattered them around the classroom, trying to represent different locations and different places that kids might be touching or high touch surfaces, or as the example from, uh, you can see the plant in the window. Uh, maybe that area doesn't get cleaned very often. So um, different things that you can use for kids to talk about germs. Uh, we've got the character identification, that's for a little bit older kids, so they can write the name. Um, it's got the explanation there of what germ it's representing, so the teachers can talk about the science. Uh, in the upper right, we've got these great story books, so you can print them. The kids can fold them up and um, the or the teacher could put them on a whiteboard or via Zoom call and, you know, just go through the steps. Um, and then the bottom is a, a tool for maybe like the preschool, kindergarten, you know, draw a line from the picture to their name. So some really fun resources there. And next slide. This is, um, oh yeah. So I did, I did put it in Spanish. The Spanish version of the website is coming soon. Um, but we do have demonstrations. So talking about cooking and food safety, you know, um, this is something that a child could do with their parent or grandparent or neighbor or the teachers could video themselves doing it. I mean, there's so many options, but the main thing is step one, wash your hands as, you know, Cole and Clayton did with their recipe contest. Fantastic. Step one, right? Um, and there's a bunch of, there's three different demonstrations. One is cooking, one is um, a, a pepper, the pepper and uh, water demonstration with the soap. If you haven't seen that, it's really fun. And um, a third one that I have to say, I can't think of right now. <laughs> okay, next slide. So we, we have a couple of quotes here from teachers and educators you know, that are working with families in the home, uh, you know, run into to things where sometimes you have the kids teaching the parents. I think someone mentioned that earlier in, in our webinar today. So teachers and educators and parents are supportive of these. Um, you know, I like how they turn the hand washing into a cartoon. We do have a video and it's short and sweet. There's a couple of videos actually and some fun things that go with it. Um, and, uh, you know, I like how you can click on the germ name. So we did include science behind it because NSF International, as you know, is public health and science based information. And uh, OK, let's go to the next one. Oh, yeah. So coming soon, I already said it. Resources in Spanish. Go to the next one. Here's some uh, translated materials. They're up and they're ready to go. but 
we are reorganizing the website again. So we did a reorg with the COVID and added added the coffee Cora, the mask well, and you know did some um, additional messaging about the coronavirus and how to talk to kids a little bit. Um, one of the things that we found is that I know there's a need for translated resources. So we um, we started with Spanish. Uh, so the, the website's gonna be reorganized a little bit more to help you find resources for pre-K, uh, preschool, first and second grade, or no, kindergarten and first grade, and then second and third grade, so that it's a little more easy to find things um, by age, by group, you know, if you have a five-year-old, but they're doing third grade work, you can go to the third grade um, section. So let's go to the video and you can get a little sneak preview. If you haven't been to the website, check it out. Kids love the Scrub Club. We help them learn to fight germs. The fun way. I'm Maskwell. I'm Slick. And I'm Carrie. Turn the kids in your life on to our new episodes about cold and flu season. And proper mask wearing. It's about hand washing. It's about masks. And it's about time. Be sure to tune in. All right. So um, this is what the website currently looks like. If you look at the top, um, there's uh, Meet the Scrub Club, which is the heroes. Then the Jeremy Villains page is where you can click on their names and expand and read more about the science for that. Um, currently, the resources tab is where all the activities, videos, uh, the information is located. So feel free to check us, check us out. And um, yeah, I got two more. Celeb um, one more. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Celebrating Global Hand Washing Day. Share your resources that, from our website. Uh, remember that it's five steps, okay? Right? If we just focus on, hey, it's five, and kids have five fingers, they can use their fingers to count the steps. So there's some really cool tricks. Um, check us out on social media. We should be more active in the next six months. And um, we'd love to hear from you. So it's scrubclub at nsf.org for email. And I think that's it. Yay. Thank you, Katie and Britt. Thank you, Mindy, for being here and sharing that with us. I did put the I put the link for the video in there, and I think someone added the link for Scrub Club too. And like I mentioned, you'll get the slides, so you'll have the links for everything. So really briefly before the Q and A, I want to share with you what's new here at the partnership. We have a few new resources um, for Global Hand Washing Day. So next slide, please. So. First up, we have created a new hand washing infographic, um, which is available to post on social media as a JPEG and also as a PDF that you can print and share at in person events. Um, it goes over when to wash your hands and also the five steps for proper hand washing. Next slide. We also have four new social media graphics, um, each focusing on one concentration area. So one of them's a reminder to wash hands before every meal. Um, one is a reminder to wash hands before helping in the kitchen, a reminder to wash hands after handling raw meat, flour, and eggs. And the last one is, again, those five steps for proper hand washing. And those are all available on our website. Next slide. Um, so you can find those um, resources in addition to more resources at fightback.org backslash hand washing. That's the link right there on this page. So we have sample social media posts that you can use um, in the next you know, week and a half leading up to Global Hand Washing Day. We have graphics that can be used all year round, the infographic the clean scene video. We have a really cool new hand washing quiz that you can share and all of our hand washing activities for kids are on that page as well. So please check that out. Next slide. Okay, time for our Q&A. 
So I'll ask our, our guest speakers to come back on. And I think we have quite a few questions here in the Q&A. Okay. So maybe Dr. Hill can jump in with this one. Is it better to dry your hands with paper towels or a hand dryer? Yeah, thanks very much. And I, I was trying to actually respond to a couple of the questions. And <clears throat> um, we actually have some information on this. I mean, the, the, the short answer is um, th there's really limited data on this. And there's nothing, um, there's no data that we've seen that, uh, that suggests that one method is, is better than the other for, for drying your hands and, <clears throat> and preventing uh, infection. So, um, so really, uh, both methods are, you know, in our, in our view, based on the data that we have, just as just as good. If you go to our cdc.gov uh, um, hand washing website, so slash hand washing, there's an FAQ page. And this is actually there's some information specific to this question on that FAQ page. Thank you, Dr. Hill. Um, I also I've seen a few questions related to hand sanitizer um, and either yours or um, the USDA's research did you consider hand sanitizer versus hand washing. And both both of you or either of you can jump in on that. I can start by saying that our research didn't specifically look at uh, hand sanitizer at this time. So hoping to maybe include it in future, but this five-year study does not look at hand sanitizer. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say around, you know, um, <clears throat> just in general around, you know, um, if you're preparing food and in the kitchen, et cetera, you've got a sink there, there's hopefully soap and water. Really, we want to encourage washing hands there, uh, especially since there are some limitations to the effectiveness of hand washing. For example, hands are kind of greasy, like if you're handling chicken or something like that. Um, you know, we really want you to wash hands. And so maybe there's some, you know, yeah, hand sanitizer can be uh, effective for, for um, you know, preventing illnesses and cleaning hands, um, but it has some limitations. Um, it's not effective against necessarily all infectious uh, germs, um, has that issue if hands are greasy or really heavily soiled or dirty, uh, doesn't remove chemicals, things like that. So, you know, we really, our, our guidance is if you can wash your hands, you got soap and water readily available, please do that. If you're not, you're out and about, you know, you're in your car, you're out in public, there's no bathroom around, then yeah, have some hand sanitizer, use that bottle that's at the, uh, at the checkout line or wherever it is and, uh, and, and do it that way. So. Uh, both are effect effective. And this is, again, for general public. None of this relates to healthcare settings or food service settings, right? So there's actual regulations and codes uh, and recommendations specific to those applications. This is about kind of just general public uh, and community settings. Thank you. Um, in a similar vein, uh, does the temperature of the water make a difference when hand washing or does the action of hand washing properly suffice? I mean, from our perspective, from the data we've seen, there's there's no uh, difference in the effectiveness of hand washing, whether it's warm or cold. So our, our guidance will say that, you know, warm or cold <laughs> is, is fine. You might see in some other guidance, you know, where it says to use warm water, um, but we haven't seen uh, enough data on that to really suggest it. So really, uh, warm or cold should be just fine. I don't know, Meredith, if you've got other input on that. Yeah. That's, that's, we stand by that as well. You know, warm water is great if you have it, but really just the act of physically scrubbing your hands is probably the more effective way of removing germs and whatnot. So the temperature of the water doesn't make too much of a difference that we really sway one way or the other. We usually follow what, you know, CDC says with the using warm water, but would recommend just using any clean running water. <laughs> And remember, right, not for food. This is, we're not talking about food right. service establishments and things like that. So if there's guidance for food preparation and, you know, restaurants and whatnot, that is different than what we're talking, what I'm talking right. about. Yep, consumers in the home. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I think this was directly for Meredith. What years were the uh, observational studies done by the USDA? 
Yes. Um, so I submitted this as an answer just in case people want to see full details. But um, year one was completed in 2017, year two, 2018, and year three, 2019. So the intention uh, starting in 2017 was to do an observation each year. And of course, the pandemic threw that off a little bit with year four. Um, so that's why we're a little delayed in getting out our results and having all the observations done. But yep, 17, 18, and 19 has been the year collected so far. Thank you. Well, this is an interesting one. If, in the absence of paper towels or a dryer, say you're in a public bathroom, what's the next best step for drying? In the absence Neither of paper towels. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly a tough one, that right? Happens. You, I mean, the, 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 the key is to get your hands dry because if you can walk outside and you start touching things, they could be, you know, have germs on them and they'll, you know, more efficiently, uh, you know, transfer to your hands. Uh, yeah, if, you, if you, there's no paper towels, no hand dryer, and you, 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 I guess you're, you're pushed to it, I, I would use my shirt probably or something like that and, and just do it that way. And then try not to touch anything and rub your hands together when you're outside, you know, air, air drying them that way, which is definitely not as efficient, time efficient as an air dryer, electric hand dryer. But if you're able to be, you know, not touching surfaces and rubbing your hands and waving them around, you're kind of doing that action and hopefully you can get them dry without, you know, too much time. Thank you. So I think we'll wrap up the Q&A portion here because we're getting super close to our, um, one, our two o'clock Eastern time. But if you have additional questions, you can always contact us at info at fightback.org. I'll put that in the chat. Um, and our guests, if you'd like to put in contact information for yourselves or your organization, if they have additional questions for you, please add that to the chat. And Michelle, would you go to the next slide for us? So before we end, uh, if, if, you're, if you haven't seen this, we have a new newsletter at the partnership called Cooking Times. This is a monthly newsletter that focuses on recipes with the food safety steps in them, and also just has some fun cooking trivia and facts. Consider signing up for that if that's something you're interested in. The link is right there. Get cookingtimes.fightback.org slash home. I think that should be at. No, I think that's right. Okay. Next slide. And a final reminder, um, the CEU certificates you can download from the chat box. You'll also get them in your follow-up email tomorrow. So please do check that. Um, and they will be available at fightback.org. You can go to our free resources tab and then the recorded webinars. They'll be up by October 8th. If you're seeking the NCHEC credits, that will be in the follow-up email because we need some additional information from you for those credits. So please, again, check the follow-up email. Next slide. And that's the end. I want to say thank you one more time to Mindy, Dr. Hill, and Meredith. Um, and that's it, everyone. Thank you for being with us here today. We hope you got some valuable information from that. I know that I did. You can contact us at info at fightback.org for more questions or information. Thank you, everyone.